Dear colleague, uh, my name is Maria Głowacz and I'm pleased to welcome you at the e-conference that we are dedicated to today to three brilliant European women, women Edith Cavell, Maria Skodowska Curie and Melina Mercury on the occasion of the Europe Day and Labour's Day. Uh, those three women are really pioneers in the different field in the health education, science, and culture. One of the direction we have received after uh, have sent the invitation was why you have invited a man to talk about those women. Our answer was that is exactly the point to give the floor to a man, a man passionate by history and amazing women contributed in a significant way to the European history. Guillaume Tostivin will then tell you they like, make you discover the incredible force of working, commitment, courage they have in common, and also will share their passions, loves, and so on. Before giving him a floor, I would like to introduce to you my colleague, Blondine Palistrandi, who is also passionate by culture and contributed to the European Cultural Project when she was working as a head of representation in Marseille, France. Blondine, could you please introduce yourself and tell us short your experience and after that, give the floor to Guillaume Tostina. Thank you and the floor is your Blondine. Thank you, Maya. Thank you and welcome to all the colleagues to celebrate uh, the work day first. And there is some lily of the valley for you, especially, and to celebrate also Sunday, um, the uh, Europe Day. Uh, so this Europe Day, its values, and you know that we are really engaged. It, it has a real sense for us to work for the European Union. Um, I have uh, uh, an experience of more than 30 years within the European Commission. I worked in several places and uh, one of the most interesting work was in Marseille. I was, I was head of representation uh, between 2004 and 2010 and I had the chance to participate to the, uh, the story of the capital of culture when Marseille was uh, selected uh, in 2008, and we prepared uh, the, the year uh, 2013, and it was really a wonderful experience of um, uh, assembling all the people, all the citizens, and uh, uh, really a great impact. And it's really a concrete Europe. And what we wanted to do through this conference today it's to, to celebrate Europe, and not really institutionally, but through the story of uh, three women uh, who uh, participate to the history, to the big history of Europe, uh, through their work, their engagement, and uh, even sometimes tragic but heroic uh, engagement. Um, and I had this idea because uh, I joined a, a webinar a few weeks ago, um, made by Guillaume, I discovered Guillaume, um, it, it was about inspiring women and he told us a, a story of uh, three very interesting women, Marie Marvin, she was a, a woman sport and uh, a pioneer in the aviation, she uh, created for instance the ambulance plane during the second world war, um, he told us about um, Nicole Bar. And you certainly know her because she's the founder of the champion Verklico. And the third woman was a computer scientist uh, by the NASA, uh, Margaret Hamilton, who was in charge, of, she was in charge of the uh, navigation software of Apollo 11. So that was very interesting. And I had the idea to join Guillaume and to ask him to uh, celebrate with us uh, this Europe Day. And uh, Guillaume, in fact, he has a very rich experience as businessman because he, he did a business school and he, he worked during uh, eight years in group, uh, big groups. And then in 2011, he created his uh, own firm dedicated to uh, gaming, uh, firm is uh, Urban Gamer. Uh, he's doing a lot of uh, creative uh, actions, events, uh, with uh, other uh, friends, 
and uh, he has created also 50 jobs all over the world. Uh, he faced a difficult situation with the, the COVID crisis and invented new way of doing, uh, for instance, away days and uh, um, seminars for, uh, for, uh, for firms and, uh, with distancial and uh, computer games. And so very, very creative. And the other passion of Guillaume is history. That's the reason why we, we are doing this uh, today. And uh, I would like uh, also to mention that uh, Guillaume is uh, a little bit more than 40 years old, but very young, and he has also the, in charge four children. So uh, a very creative, a passionate, and a positive man. And um, so I give you the floor, Guillaume. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blandine, about uh, this introduction. And uh, I'm really, really glad to, uh, to be there with you. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Blandine, to give me the opportunity to, uh, to share my passion, to share uh, if lessons learned about inspiring women. We uh, build this uh, conference together. And definitely, yes, it's a great opportunity uh, uh, for me. And uh, I hope you will enjoy um, this conference and this, uh, this webinar. Uh, what was really interesting is uh, when we prepare the, uh, uh, the conference, we thought about different kind of women uh, and some, uh, I'm sure you've got some, uh, you already heard about some, uh, some women. For example, if I told you about Edith Cavell, maybe you will have in mind and uh, top of mind the hospital, but do you really know Edith Cavell and what she did and so on? This is the story behind uh, all the places on the um, all the uh, all the facts that you can uh, you couldn't imagine. The idea is to give you with this uh, conference uh, another vision of this uh, inspiring woman. So uh, how it how it will. Um, how the webinar will be uh, will be done. Uh, I will uh, I will check sometimes on every character on every uh, woman. I will share right to new to you um, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, be sure, relax. You will receive the PowerPoint after uh, the conference, and uh, we will ask you uh, also to mute the. Microphone, but of course, of course, you can ask some question. Blandin and Maria will help me during all this conference to uh, to, uh, to to share the question at different times. So definitely, of course, it's not what would I say a monologue or a speech. It's an interactive session. Once again, I don't want you to uh, to sleep during the the conference. My my purpose is that you can live with us uh, this inspiring uh, lives life of uh, of this uh, three women, and I'm sure that uh, yeah you will enjoy it and we'll have uh, many many questions. Okay, so if you agree, I will share. Uh, the presentation and we will start with Edith Cavell. Exactly. Just a second. Nadine Maya, can you confirm me that you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So let's go. I will say, so, as you can see, the European uh, flag and also Edith Cavell, Maria Sklodowska, Mike Curie, and Melina Mercury. This is all the three women that we decided to uh, to to, uh, to put in evidence in Zoom. I would say uh, for for this conference. Uh, after this introduction that uh, Blondine and Maria performed, so I will focus on Edith Cavell, uh, this uh, her life and all her conviction and all. Her, uh, fate and destiny. After it will be Marie Curie, Marie Skodowska, and I will finish with Melina Mercury. What is important with all the three women, we've got three different kind of women, uh, different culture, different countries, but they've got a lot of things in common, devotion, engagement, um, I would say culture, uh, freedom, fragility, and so on. So several uh, several common points. Okay, 
So if you agree, let's start with Edith Cavell. So Edith Cavell, so as I said, it's more than an hospital located in Brussels. She's, uh, she's British she, in terms of nationality and in terms of profession, she used to be a nurse and a director, a kind of management of nurse, we will see that. In terms of skills, so it's, uh, of course, um, she get a lot of medical nursing and management skills, it's also in terms of personal characteristic, it's her involvement and devotion that you get to get in mind. Her main achievement, if you have one thing to remember, is her resistance action and how she helped soldier during, sorry for the <laughs> mistakes, worldwide one. So about Edith Cavell. Okay, you can see a map with uh, different places, and of course, I will explain the uh, different location. So, about her childhood. First, Edith is born on 4 December in 1865 in Swaderston, in, uh, in an Anglican uh, family, because she's the uh, eldest of the four children of the Reverend Frederick Cavell. Frederick Cavell is a vicar for 45 years in Swaderston. So uh, is really important in the city. Edith Cavell is born into a Christian and ethnic father and um, system and it. So it's ethical is really important. And from the cradle, uh, she's, she's really um, impregnated of the duty to share and to, to help those who are in pain. Reverend Cavell is really I would say strong and half is expecting her children, his children to be conformist with and to be devoted. So uh, for Edith Cavell, it's, um, it's, yeah, she understands that of course, but she loves her Swadeston childhood. So the city where she lives, she said, it's a time when life was fresh and beautiful on the country, so desirable and sweet. So we can imagine in kind of landscape that, uh, that she, she, she lived in, um, in the end of uh, 19th century. But Edith Cavell's father, once again, is stern, is censorious. Her mother is gentle, is loving. And from her, her mother, Edith will learn a lot, especially about cooking, about housekeeping, garden keeping and so on, but she uh, definitely loved her mother. She has a talent for languages, particularly French, and she loved drawing. In 1988, it's a really important fact, she's 15 and uh, she, Edith Cavell, and her sisters we are, will be taught in, uh, by a live governess. Governess is really, really important in England. I will, I will come back later of this. But this governess, I had Joyce Baker, is really important for Edith Cavell. And Edith Cavell will learn a lot with, uh, with her. And she realized that uh, governess is definitely, yeah, a, a profession that should be, uh, uh, should be inevitable for her if she looked uh, about uh, the, um, the, the expectation of her father. So she had in mind, she, she said, oh, okay, I'm supposed to become a governess. It would be my fate. And between uh, 1982 and 19, 1984, she's going to, to go to three different boarding schools. Uh, and she will be away from her mother, her sister, her brother, and from, um, from friends. And from this school, she will learn a lot, but also self-discipline, self-discipline, sorry, application. And um, of course, she, she has less emotion and she learn about loneliness, really loneliness. It's really important. And um, of course, with this three, um, with this three boarding school, she's, she's coming, she, she, uh, she lives far from Swaderston and every summer she uh, come back and she gave uh, her mother an album of drawings and watercolors about the, the place where she uh, lived during the, 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 the study, Laurel Court. And uh, really, you can, we, can, uh, we can find the, the, uh, 
the drawings of Edith Cavell, you can see there's a lot of flowers, birds, and so on. She really developed an artistic talent. Anyway, uh, so as I said, she's supposing that her friend would become a governess. But uh, once again, uh, she, um, she, sorry, what's that? In fact, the Reverend Cavell found a post of governess at Powell's family uh, for her. It's with church connection in St. Peter's Borough and so on. So it's where you get the, 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 the figure of two. And once again, you've got 25,000 governors in England in the second half of 19th century. So governors generally end up as single. So society gives us little opportunity for romance or even close French, uh, friendship. So this is, I would be her fate, but she accepted. In the summer, uh, Edith Cavell decided to travel to Germany and she discovered Europe. And it's really important because she will discover different kinds of cultures and so on, different civilization. And definitely it's really important for her to traveling Europe in 1988. And Guillaume, tell us, what yeah. uh, lesson did she get from this travel, travel to Europe? Yes, thanks, Blandine. In fact, in fact, in fact she, she realized that work abroad will give her a lot of opportunity, but also a wider horizon for herself. And she realized she has few opportunities once again. Marriage is not her expectation. And of the four of the children uh, from the Cavell, only one is expected to marry and have children. And uh, so this definitely, when she's coming back to uh, Swarderston, she wants to uh, go abroad and to work abroad. And uh, Miss Gibson, a richer, heard about that uh, Edith wanted to work abroad. And she recommends Edith as a governor to Paul Francois, Paul Francois, it's a Brussels lawyer from, she knew from the Catholic Church. So it's an opportunity for Edith to live abroad, to perfect her French and work uh, in a city that seems as safe as civilized, I would say, that in, in England. So she's, as I said, uh, in, the, in the figure three, you can see she's, uh, she's going to, to Brussels, but Edith Cavell's loneliness is inevitable because she's a stranger in a foreign land. She has no particular friends in Brussels. She has little time to herself and no social calendar uh, of her own. So every summer she's coming back to Swaderstone and taking seaside holidays with her family and so on. And um, in 1985, Edith Cavell leaves Brussels and the Francois family to Waterloo home because there's a big event, I would say, in our family his father is coming ill, he's got a serious illness, and Edith gives support to her mother, and she, it will be an opportunity to rethink uh, her work. And, and now she's 30 years old, and yeah. uh, what, what was the result of this uh, experience of care? This experience of care, of caring her father, led her to become, I would say, a nurse, uh, because she, she, she realized that the job of the governess is a closed way. And once again, marriage is not the solution. So moreover, two sisters of her uh, are trained nurses. So as she is devoted, she, uh, she loves altruism, she gets a strong desire to help the hurt and so on. She realized that uh, to be a nurse could be the right uh, profession for her. And Edith Cavell has a strong sense of social justice and she wants a career. Moreover, her years in Belgium gave her independence from her father with pressive words. So definitely it's a good time to change. And uh, she, she's, yes, she's taking uh, the opportunity and she decides to take formal training and make nursing her career. So, in 1986, she applied to the London hospitals in Whitechapel at the East End. And uh, Miss Dickinson, a former teacher, 
gave her a reference, and I, I love the reference because she said Miss Cavill is elderly, elderly, sorry, methodical, kindly, gentle disposition. She had an equa equable temper, a very pleasant manner, well educated, intelligent, good moral character, and and she said she's a very suitable con candidate for training as an hospital nurse. I would say you don't have this kind of recommendation uh, if you uh, if you are not, I would say, um, devoted and uh, definitely that's a good opportunity uh, for us. So no more governess, nursing will be a project. So let's see, you know, in the second part, because uh, she, 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 of course, has to, uh, to perform her nurse uh, skills. So she's coming to uh, first in London. Um, she's passing the examination in a, in a way in order to be a staff nurse. And be, I would say for Edith Cavell, um, it's the beginning to, to be an immersion of, uh, into the drama of hospital life. So, Edith Cavell's first, um, first uh, action uh, in the hospital is very simple. It's making beds, polishing, dusting, fetching, carrying, and so on. But uh, definitely, she wants to, uh, to go further. And there's another opportunity for her. It's to work at the St. Pancras Infirmary in 1901. And infirmary is really important. It's a kind of, uh, I would say, a public, uh, public hospital. And um, Edith Cavell and, uh, and uh, Emma Berich, it's her colleague, are each responsible for 250 beds. Once important, she's not alone because in London, uh, she can have support of her sister, Florence, uh, who is night superintendent at uh, not too far from the St. Pancras Infirmary. Anyway, uh, after five years in St. Pancras Infirmary, it's really important uh, before the opportunity of, uh, of Brussels, I forgot to mention, but she, she will lead a burnout in, 90, uh, in 1906. She said, I've now been nursing for 10 consecutive years without a break and feel very much in need of long rest. She will, she will take about six months off work. She, she will have no real security and she doesn't know she will get a job uh, when she will return. Uh, so she, of course, uh, coming back to Swarderston, uh, she, uh, she, she, she looked for a, a more quiet job and so on. She's 41, met, uh, she's looking for another new experience. And this opportunity appeared one year later in 1907 because uh, she's, uh, she's asked by Antoine de Page, maybe you know this character if you're located in Brussels. Antoine de Page, uh, in fact, is impressed by the English model of trained nurses. And uh, Antoine de Page, he asked Edith Cavell if she could be this is a manager of the first training school for nurses. And he planned to open in October this, uh, this, um, this first training school. And uh, of course, the page, he wants to work with nurses because they are not found. They are not, they are not found in Belgium. So he's really an innovator and a reformer. And did Edith uh, immediately accept this proposal? In fact, it can be surprising, but she is hesitating because to come back in Brussels, it's to be, it would be like going back in time. So uh, she know it was difficult in, uh, in Brussels at first. And once again, she will be separated from her sister, from her mother, from friends, from colleagues. Anyway, anyway, as, she, as I said before, she was looking for um, really uh, wide experience, uh, she accepts the challenge. And um, what is in interesting is uh, Edith Cavell. So uh, you can see in the, in the Brussels map, it's the first location of the school before, uh, before moving. And Edith Cavell will be really uh, 
we uh, look to the school that uh, that about the management of the school, but to be sure that uh, all the patients are, uh, of course, well cared with uh, good nurses, with instructed domestic staff. Uh, she uh, she interviews prospective uh, nurses, she lectures the nurses, uh, she, she performs a lot of job, a lot of job of, of management uh, during uh, all this experience. If there is an operation, of course, she assists the surgeon. In fact, the objective of the school is, uh, there are three objectives. First, to create a profession for women, nurse. Second, to forward the course of science. And third, to provide the best possible help for, of course, sick and suffering and so on. Uh, to, to realize the school has 50 boarding rooms for students, so really de dedicated uh, school, two operation of theaters, and but her main problem is hiring, it's recruiting, because there's such success of the school that she gets some problem to uh, recruit good, uh, good and qualified nurses. So what, what can she do? She's coming to be an ambassador for nursing because once again, it's a kind of new, uh, new job for, uh, for Brussels in Brussels. So she starts writing article on nurses magazine to hire uh, qualified nurses. And uh, so, so she, she's publishing an article in, of the school in London, for example, a nursing mirror. So you've got some uh, British nurses that flowing, that you're coming to uh, Brussels. And uh, she succeeds to get 23 uh, new nurses uh, on uh, owing the, the training courses. So this, it's the beginning of the new reputation. And she, she will attend the International Congress of Nurses in London as part of the Belgian delegation. She gives a lecture in, on the schools about, uh, about hopes and ambition about the, the, the nurse job. So it's really interesting because uh, you've got a, a person from Brittany uh, working in Brussels, coming back in uh, London to, uh, to give her vision of nursing. So definitely she, uh, she, for her, I would say nursing has no frontier. Uh, anyway, uh, so with a lot of article in La Firmière, she, uh, she, she's writing a lot of uh, different, uh, different newspaper, Nursing Mirror, Le Devoir d'une Infirmière, uh, for example. So, um, Definitely, she, uh, she, she, she tried to, to be a, more than an ambassador, but also a lecturer in a way, uh, because for her to be a nurse, it's a real duty for her passion, for the family, for the friends, and it's really important that they understand the, uh, the nurse job. And how did she manage uh, the nurses? How was she with them? She, it's interesting because her management is strict. It's, she's focusing on discipline and rules. She has the same rule of chastity uh, at the London Hospital. No married nurse, uh, no going out with the doctors or medical students, uh, lights out, front door locked by 10. So she definitely put the same, I would say, uh, rigor that she, she had with her, her father. Uh, in uh, nursing. So it was, I think, quite tough management, but uh, for her, it was so, uh, so intense and so important for her that she had to put really discipline and, uh, and rules. And within a year, she was training uh, nurses for three hospitals, 24 schools, and 13 kindergartens in Belgium. Another short story, um, one day in 1910, uh, there's a dog that shows up at the garden door uh, at the school, he's gray on his back and so on. And um, Edith Cavell decided to, uh, to feed him and uh, he didn't go away, he stayed with uh, Edith Cavell um, and uh, 
she called him Jack. And uh, when, when, you, uh, uh, when you can meet Edith Cavill in the street, of course, there was Jack Weaver. Uh, right now, here you can see uh, in, in the new place of the hospital because um, the hospital decided to move uh, from one to, the, to, to the, from uh, the first location to the second location, or where you can see Centre Hospitalier Edith Cavell, uh, just before, just a few months before the First World War. And here you can have the picture of the current uh, hospital Edith Cavell. First World War and resistance. So it's the key part of the life of Edith Cavell, because when the First World War starts, she uh, decided to stay in Brussels because uh, for her, uh, she, she definitely, she realized that uh, with Brussels invasion, uh, Brussels will be in the middle of the First World War. So it's not feasible for her, I mean, her mind to leave Brussels, to come back in, in Britain, to be safe and so on. No, she has to be there. She has to be in the middle of the war. But she's concerned for her mother uh, who lived alone. Uh, she's unable to send her money. Uh, it's difficult to write to her. So yes, it's quite difficult for her in terms of dilemma, but uh, definitely she, uh, she prepared that uh, Brussels will be uh, a center for the care of all the wounded soldiers uh, between France, Germany, and Belgium. And um, so moreover, Antoine de Page, uh, her boss, is the president of the Red Cross in Belgium. And another short story, when Brussels is invited by German, Hedit Cavell talk to her, her nurses. Of course, they are scared. And she said to her, to, to all the nurses, any wounded soldier must be treated, friend. Each man is a father, is a husband, is a nurse. So as nurses, you, uh, you have to take no part in the war. Uh, our work is for humanity. Uh, so the profession of nursing knew no frontiers. So it's really important in terms of, uh, of speech. And how did she react to the German occupation of Brussels? Yes, it's qu quite difficult for her because, um, of course, German occupied Brussels, and it's difficult to, uh, as as Britain, uh, and to, to obey to uh, to German. And uh, uh, on one side, she got a father that she had to uh, to to obey and uh, in fact on the other part it's that's really important she she discovered europe she discovered freedom she uh, she traveled so far so she know independence so uh, for her military domain is really in contradiction with uh, her values so she will not obey the commands of german she's too brave uh, as a woman and so, yes, she, 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 she decided to, uh, to have this, uh, this intention to not obey to every orders of the German. And it's important because uh, in November 19, uh, 1914, uh, Edith Cavell made the choice to help allied soldiers escape. Uh, how? Because, uh, in fact, um, wounded British and French soldiers, as well as Belgian and French uh, civilians uh, of military age, uh, they are hidden from the German with the réseau de Croix. Uh, donc, c'est uh, uh, Marie de Croix and Reginald de Croix in the Chateau of Bellini. And from there, from this place, they are conducted to the houses of uh, uh, Edith Cavell, but also other places in Brussels. And they are hidden. Here you can see um, a painting uh, showing uh, Edith Cavell in the middle and all the wounded soldiers uh, that are hidden to German authority. So it's important because 
Cavill, Edith Cavill is in violation of the German military law. And of course, several months, uh, there's no, uh, no suspicious, but they coming to be uh, really suspicious of uh, all this action of resistance. And even there's a mutual active network and so on. Uh, it's really, uh, it's really uh, yes, an intense life because any error or indiscretion might blow I would say all the cover of the uh, of the resistance. So, uh, for example, she said when the first two wounded uh, English soldiers arrive, arriving at Edith Cavill's door in Rue de la Culture, she had no idea of what to do with them. So she had put them to bed as patients. So as patients in the hospital. That's that was the start of the the resistance. After she becomes more and more experienced with coded exchanges. And uh, she, she know uh, a different procedure and so on. So like a, like a real spy, I would say. And um, uh, Prince Reginald de Croix warned the group about a risk of an arrest. And she asked to destroy all evidence and to say nothing to anyone. Anyway, Edith Cavell, she said, uh, she says to, to, to him that she's expected to be arrested at any moment. And she will not, if it is the case, seek to escape. So um, she, she said she, uh, she had all addresses, letters, newspaper, diaries, and so on. Um, in fact, we are not sure that she all destroyed, but we, uh, after the war, we, uh, we got her diary about the occupation. And, uh, and it's really interesting to, uh, to, uh, to look to the diary and all the notes of, uh, of Edith. So Edith Cavill is assuming danger, definitely. And what happened It's uh, she's arrested on uh, August 1915, on the 3rd. And uh, of course, she, in fact, she has been betrayed by Georges Gaston Coin, Coin who was later convicted by a French court uh, as a collaborator. He, he'd been uh, in Brussels two months ago and he realized uh, about the action of uh, Edith Cavill. So uh, she's arrested, she's held in uh, Saint Gilles prison for 10 weeks. Uh, and of course, she, uh, the German authority start to, um, to, uh, to prepare I would say the, the trial, and um, and definitely she admits her guilt when she signed a statement the day before the trial. So just before the trial, she admits uh, she is uh, she is guilt. And, uh, and did she yes. try to defend herself, or uh, and did she receive uh, help from countries, uh, UK particularly? In fact, the British government could do nothing to help her. Uh, in the Foreign Office of British government said, I'm afraid that it is likely to go hard with Miss Cavill. I'm afraid we are powerless. And um, of another one, uh, another secretary for foreign affairs said, any representation by us will do her more harm than good. So she don't have the support of, uh, of uh, Britain, gover Britain government. And what is important to, uh, to understand is that as Cavell declared that soldier she had helped uh, uh, thanked her in waiting when they arrived safely in Britain, Cavell of course acknowledged that and the penalty uh, for this, uh, this, uh, this action in terms of German military law is death. And um, it's, uh, you've got a specific paragraph about, I would say, a betrayal. And um, the German will, uh, will use this, uh, this argument to, uh, to, to, yes, to, uh, to judge Cavell of death penalty. Another um, short story, the night before her execution, she told the reverend uh, that, I see her, I'm thankful to have had these 10 weeks of quiet to get ready. Now I have had them and I've been kindly treated here. I expected my sentence and I believe it was just. 
standing as I do in view of God of eternity, I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness towards anyone. And even the night before the execution, uh, as I said, the, um, the British, the British uh, government did nothing, but the US ambassador to Belgium wrote a personal note on, uh, uh, on Cavell's, uh, on Cavell's trials uh, to, um, to a governor general of Belgium. There, there was some pressure to, uh, to help her, but despite all these efforts, uh, the general of, um, so Baron von der Lucken allowed the execution to proceed and Edith Cavell is executed. So you see only the, the next day after the, the trial because the German wanted to speed up and uh, 16 men forming two firing squad in, decided to, uh, to, uh, to shoot uh, at 7 a.m. on 12 October. 1915. So what's next? It's the beginning of another story, I would say, because uh, she becomes a worldwide symbol. In the months and the year following Cavell's death, there's newspaper, articles, there's a lot of books, and she becomes, I would say, a worldwide symbol, but also a propaganda figure for uh, military recruitment in Britain. Uh, she had to have an increased positive sentiment for the allies in the United States. She's popular because she was a nurse and she definitely has an neuric approach to death. Um, moreover, she is, the execution is represented as uh, a German, an act of German barbarism. You can see uh, here a picture showing um, propaganda and uh, it was really difficult for, uh, for German because uh, some weeks before they, 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 they performed, they, they did um, a massacre uh, in Dinan, it was just, uh, just before. So uh, everyone in the world is shocked about this uh, execution and um, she really symbolized, I would say, um, a woman's dedication in wartime. And um, this execution is really the subject of a lot of articles in the international uh, press. And in Great Britain, of course, she's regarded as uh, a martyr. And uh, what is important also is Edith Cavell affair and the um, RMS Lusitania, you know, the submarine uh, that has been torpid, torpid. We think that these two actions uh, help the United States to, uh, to uh, decide to go uh, to war. Uh, here you can see so uh, other newspaper and also uh, a movie uh, about the Cavill case. Uh, here you can see some picture. Of course, a lot of homage in the world it's interesting because uh, after the war, his body, her body is exhumed and brought back to the UK. And she, she had memorial service at Westminster Abbey conducted by the King himself. And um, she's, rubber, she's would say, buried in, uh, in uh, Lives Green. It's uh, in the Norwich Cathedral, not too far from Swaddeston. And each year you've got uh, a service uh, to, uh, to his grave. Here you can see other, um, other um, homage, I would say. Uh, you've got a mount uh, in Canada with Mount Edith Cavell. We've got a specific pose uh, also called Edith Cavell. You've got the statue of Edith Cavell in Trafalgar Square. And the last, uh, last short story, um, uh, parents of Edith Piaf uh, decided to give uh, their, their surname of, uh, of their daughter, uh, Edith, a few months later uh, of the ex execution of Edith. So the key message, uh, what is important that you get in mind is Edith Cavill, uh, she, she performed, I would say she wanted to go beyond being a nurse by promoting this new profession 
for the school, the creation of magazines. So she really got a role of ambassador and it's really important to give meaning to your work. Uh, she was more she was a promoter and it's really important to have in mind. Uh, she got the, uh, she takes the responsibility for her, her action. She doesn't seek to, uh, to deny them. She gets some humility, she assume. Never underestimate consequence of your de decision because during crisis, uh, you have to, to take a step back from decisions. The German empire underestimates all the public opinion and the press about uh, Edith Cavell affair. And once again, open your horizon because uh, as I said in the beginning, Edith Cavell's European trips were really important for her and for a new accomplishment. And it's really important because we are here uh, talking about women and Europe, Brittany, Brussels, uh, Belgium, and so on. And open your horizons, help, uh, help you after burnout, after uh, interrogation, to, uh, to give more uh, sense to uh, what you do. This is, this is uh, the focus for Edith Cavill. Right now, I propose a new character and it's Maurice Klodowska. I hope that, <laughs> that uh, you're still there to, uh, to discuss about Maurice Klodowska. Of course, you know her as Marie Curie, but you had to know that uh, she is Polish. She's a chemist and researcher, took a lot of skills in terms of physics, chemistry, mathematics. In terms of personal characteristics, uh, yes, a lot of um, rigor, rigorous, I would say, devotion, devotion in, in family and in, uh, in science, I would say, and definitely moderate life, you would see that. Her main achievements, she discovered and isolated radium and polonium, and of course, Maybe you heard about that. She won two Nobel Prizes. So now, if you agree, let's move on to uh, Marie Curie's story, uh, or Mais Klodowska. Yes, first let's discuss about Mais Klodowska. She's born in Warsaw in, nine, in 1867, so two years after Edith Cavill. Um, what is important, she's the fifth and youngest child of well-known teachers. But the context is important, and I know it's important for Maya, because uh, after the January uprising uh, in, uh, in 1863, the Congress Kingdom of Poland is totally abandoned. So the Polish language is banned from office and education, and there's a process of Russification of the whole administration. And on both paternal and maternal sides, the family lose a lot in terms of properties, fortune, and so on. So definitely she starts in a difficult way because Maria and her sister, uh, for example, got a difficult situation to handle uh, as uh, as girl. And, um, and uh, the education will be, uh, will be really important for them. Her father of Maya uh, taught mathematics and physics, subject that Maya uh, is willing to pursue, and um, is also director of two Varso Gymnasia, secondary uh, schools for boys. So definitely uh, she has a father dedicated to, uh, to education. The mother, her mother Maya, is uh, operating in a um, Varso boarding school for girls. And she decided to resign uh, from uh, her position after uh, the born of Maria. But uh, Maria mother dies of tuberculosis. Maria is only 10. And it's really important because uh, for her, uh, it's a really a tragedy to, to lose her mother. And uh, less than three years earlier, Maria, older sibling Sophia, has died of typhus, contracted uh, from her border. So, really difficult situation. And um, Maria, so when she's ten, she attends a gymnasium for for girls, from which she's graduated with a gold medal. And uh, she spent she spent. Um, Sometimes uh, with, of course, her father. She spent some time uh, in a regular institution of higher education, 
because she's a, she's a woman. So she and her sister, Bronia, are uh, involved in uh, what we call Flying University. It's a Polish patriotic institution of higher learning that admitted women students. What is important, Maria made an agreement with her sister, Bronia, that she would give her financial assistance during medical studies in Paris because Bronia is going to move to, to, to Paris and she attend in exchange similar assistance and it will happen two years later. So, uh, so there's a really strong relationship between Maria and her sister Bronia and an agreement. Um, in connection uh, to this, she, uh, she actually have a job and it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's, um, but uh, we saw Edith Cavill, the position of governess. In fact, Maria will take also a position as governess, uh, first as a home tutor in Vassal and then two years uh, as a governess in uh, uh, London family, the Zorowski, and uh, they are relatives to her, uh, of her father. And uh, what is important, she fell in love with the son of the family, Kazimierz Zorowski, and uh, the parents rejected the idea of, of marriage, and uh, Kazimierz uh, was, was, not, uh, was unable to oppose to the decision of, the, of uh, his parents. And for Maria, the loss of the relationship with Zorowski will be very tragic uh, for her. Zorowski will become a famous uh, mathematician. So once again, they, they get science and mathematics in common. Anyway, she's leaving Poland for Paris in late 18, uh, 18, sorry, 1891. So she's, you can count 24. And, and she starts uh, uh, the Maya university and, and, and Paris. That, yeah, she starts university in Paris, exactly. And she, uh, she met again, so uh, her sisters. And um, yes, so she, uh, she proceeded with her study of physics, chemistry, mathematics at the University of Paris. And how was the studies at the university? It, it, it would be very difficult for her to, to, to find herself a place in the university in Paris. Exactly, because she's only, uh, there's only 23 women in two father students uh, in the School of Science. So it's really few, it's only uh, 10%. The conditions are really difficult. The room she's wanting is so cold in winter that the water is freezing the bathroom. Uh, she, subsists, uh, she, she has small resources. She keeping herself warm during cold winters, uh, but she focused so hard on her studies that she sometimes forgot to eat. It's really important to, uh, to, uh, to, to say she's brilliant, but she forgets to care about herself. She recalls this two and a half a year of deprivation, but it's one of the best memories of my life. She, 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 she would say that in her biography, and she will achieve her dream of study, liberty, independence. And um, she said, all my mind was centered on my study. I divided my time between courses, exper experimental work, study in the library. In the evening, I walked in my room, sometimes very late uh, into, into the night. And um, all that I saw and learned was a new delight to me. It was like a new world opened to me, the world of science, which I was at last permitted to know in all liberty. You have to know that students can utter in the Sorbonne whatever classes they wanted, whenever they wanted. But she's facing some difficulties, definitely, because a fellow student advised her to make soup to keep her strength. She has no idea how to do it, for example, to, do, to perform soup. She doesn't want to spend her time learning how to make a soup. She doesn't know where to shop. And uh, one day, uh, without eating regularly, she faints, she collapses in the library. Anyway, uh, it's important to be in 18, 
1994, I would say, because Pierre Curie will enter in her life and uh, how, 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 had, how did it happen, in fact. To explain, Marie was looking for space to research. And uh, she used to, um, to, to perform a research in Professor Lippmann laboratory at, at, the Sorbonne, uh, at the Sorbonne. But the space was so limited that she's making little pro pro progress. A friend of her sister, Bonia, recommends that she, uh, she meets a physicist who is one of the most eminent experts on the law of magnetism, and it's Pierre Curie. And Pierre Curie is uh, an instructor of, at the City of Paris Industrial Physics and Chemistry Higher Educational Institution. And, uh, but more important, Marie knows Pierre Curie with the name, with the reputation, because he had invented a number of delicate instruments that might help with her work. In fact, Pierre Curie cannot offer Marie of more larger space, but he can offer her expert expert advice on her project. So the night Pierre met Marie, he's unaware of how much they had in common, but he's sure, Pierre is sure, he's convinced he met a woman of genius. That's, uh, that's he, what he said at that time. Um, Pierre and Marie Curie, they are performing most of their research and experimentation in their laboratory, and one chemist, uh, said it was, uh, it describes the laboratory across between a stable and a potato shed. Uh, he even claimed that once he saw the laboratory, he thought it was a joke because it was definitely uh, too simple and definitely uh, not adaptable for any research. The mutual passion of Pierre and Marie for science bring them increasingly closer and they begin to develop feelings for each other. But, uh, so moreover, so Pierre is more than the man of the situation, but Marie returns, decides to return to Varsau for the summer. And Pierre suffers from the situation. He fears that he might never return to Paris. So he's writing to her, uh, I see it's uh, Pierre. It would be a fine thing to pass our lives niche, near each other hypnotized by your dreams, your patriotic dream, an all scientific dream. If you were French, you could easily become a professor in a lycée or a normal school for girls. Does this profession appeal to you? So I would say Pierre is trying to, uh, to convince her to, uh, to come back in France. But in another letter, he suggests that when she returned after the summer, they could share an apartment, a flat, which would be slip, split so that she could have privacy. She refused the arrangement, and uh, she she refuses. And and how uh, how Pierre reacted? In fact, Pierre decided, I would say, uh, to propose uh, uh, the marriage. Uh, at first, Maria don't accept, as she's still planning to stay back to a native country. Uh, but uh, Pierre Curie decided, okay, is willing to travel to Poland. He declares that he's ready to move with her to Poland, even if her, her career will be reduced to, to teaching French to students. And Marie realized, wow, it's definitely is the man of my life. And Marie accepts the wedding and accepts to come back uh, in Paris. So they are getting married in So without religious service. The reception is really uh, simple in Pierre Parent's home in So, and uh, they are living uh, So on a pair of bicycles they had purchased as the winning gift, and definitely at that time they are deeply in love. Anyway, Marie and Pierre are really absorbed in their work, uh, and Pierre. He, he got the same problem, I would say, of Marie. He forgot, he forget sometimes to, to, to think about himself. Sometimes he couldn't recall what he ate for dinner or even if he had eaten at all. They are really hard workers. They are really hard performers. Uh, they are sharing so pastimes and I say long bicycle trips. And at night, without telling uh, 
Pierre, Mary is attending class on crystals in order to better understand the work of, uh, of Pierre. So I think it's really, uh, really interesting the, to know that uh, she, uh, she, did, uh, she did this class without telling me. And uh, what is important is the, the following step because they will uh, perform a hard work sequence of several, uh, of several years, because uh, in 1895, X-rays and uranium rays opened the way to, uh, to their research because uh, it's a really important discoveries. And uh, Marie Curie is deciding to look into uranium rays as possible field of research for TEDS. And using the tool of uh, Pierre, she discovers that uranium rays cause the air around a sample to conduct electricity. So definitely with uranium rays, you can perform some electricity. So it's a huge achievement. And at that time, she's, she's 30, she's, uh, and, uh, she's getting pregnant, and you can see uh, the two daughters of Pierre and Marie. And uh, so Irene will uh, come in the life of Pierre and uh, Marie. But it's really important because uh, at that time she had the subject of the research and she, uh, she's getting pregnant. Um, and how is uh, she managing her pregnancy in this very, very busy time for her? Exactly. So Marie got a heavy workload coupled with childcare. So uh, at lunchtime in the evening, uh, Marie washes home to nurse Irene. So uh, it's really a difficult situation. And when she cannot feed enough milk to satisfy uh, Irene, uh, she's forced to hire a wet nurse uh, for that action. And in order to return to work, she will hi hire a second nurse. So um, another story is interesting. Between September and December, uh, 1897, Mary is exhausted and depressed, and she gets uh, panic uh, at a specific time. She just suddenly runs from the laboratory and races to the Parc Montsouri because she definitely sure that the nurse had lost her baby. Of course not, but definitely she really had some difficulties to manage uh, this period. On the professional part, Pierre Curie is really increasingly curious by the work of Marie, and uh, he decides to drop all this work on crystals and to join her. And uh, in July 1898, um, they both publishing a joint paper announcing the existence of an element that they named polonium in honor of native, uh, native Poland of Marie. And ironically, the Poland remains partition among three empires, Russian, Austrian, and Prussian at that time. So definitely, Poland is really important for Mary. So let's sum up polonium and uranium are discovered. Okay, that's a good job. And they decide also the word radioactivity with ray, uh, in terms of ray, and all the, all the activity coming from uh, X-ray, uranium ray, and radium. And even polonium and radium are discovered, they are discovered only theoretically. So for physicists, they, they are agreed to accept the curious discovery, but uh, chemists, not. And definitely it's a new step, they had to isolate radium, they had to isolate uh, polonium because, uh, because to convince of uh, the interest of their, um, of their discovery. And um, of course, they had no idea of the workload of the task. It will require uh, skills, persistence, high education, and they are, they are figure out how, uh, how radium look like, what, what kind of color, uh, we, we will see when we will uh, isolate radium. So uh, Mary is definitely sure that uh, she, 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 she's accomplished huh, once again. And what is important, she's feeling that without speaking, Pierre and, and her, she, they understand themselves. 
She's writing to her sister, Bronya, that she's married to the most wonderful man in the world. At night, they are sleeping in each other's arms. So they, they show really strong uh, relationships and, of, and love and collaboration. And, and how Irene grew up? Yes, in this environment, it's interesting, a short story. When Irene is three and a half, she asks her father why her mother had to leave her to work all the time since the mother of her friend stayed at home. And uh, Pierre tried to explain that she's doing great work. And she takes Irene to the laboratory to show her what they did. And the child is surprised because she's saying that it's a sad, sad place. And um, in fact, Irene, like a lot of children, her demands marry attention. She cries when Mary left the room. She refused to go to sleep without her mother's kiss. So uh, yes, it's quite difficult uh, for, for, for Irene. What's interesting is uh, in, um, in 19 de Rodero, I would say that it's the beginning of a new century. There's two main events uh, because one, on one side, uh, Curie becomes, Marie Curie becomes the first woman faculty member at Normal Sup, what you said. And Pierre joined the faculty of the University of Paris. It's also the Paris Exposition Universal. And uh, of course, they all are talking about electricity, but also radioactivity. And uh, it's interesting because Pierre and Marie Curie uh, are getting more and more reputation as they are invited to the Royal Institution in London to give speech on radioactivity and so on. But uh, there's a shocking fact, as she's a woman uh, during, for example, the, the speech on the Royal Institution in London, uh, Pierre Curie is allowed to speak, but not marry. Uh, so uh, another thing, the new industry of radioactivity begins its development based on radium. And uh, surprisingly, Pierre and Marie doesn't patent their discovery and the benefits. Uh, they, uh, where they, they could uh, definitely uh, perform some profitable business anyway. Another thing which is really important is the Nobel Prize because we are in uh, 1903 and one member of the Nobel Science Committee, Magnus Costa Mita Gleffler, he believes that women in science are not enough appreciated. And he observes that Marie Curie's name is uh, totally uh, erased from a letter to the Nobel Prize. She's not present on the letter. So he writes privately to, uh, to Pierre to warn him about the situation. And Pierre responds, if there's no Marie on the letter, he cannot accept the prize unless the Nobel Committee includes Marie on the Nobel Prize. Of course, uh, Mita Gleffler, so the, the, the sponsor of Pierre, will use his affluence to add Marie Curinen to, to the letter of nomination. But at first, the committee members claims it's impossible because the nomination letter is already filled, is already sent. And it's another uh, committee member uh, that said, oh, hey, remember, we uh, put the name of Mary in the nomination for the Nobel Prize in the two years before. So definitely it should work for uh, this, uh, this new year. So, but without the action of this, uh, of this superlative um, mathematician, maybe Marie Curie wouldn't be on the uh, Nobel Prize. So she's the first woman to be awarded a Nobel Prize. They surprisingly they declined to go to Stockholm to receive the prize in person. The main reason they were too busy. They were too busy with their work. And Pierre Curie saying that he's uh, increasingly uh, ill. Anyway, the award money uh, allows the Curies to hire their first laboratory assistants. Imagine they use the, the money of the first Nobel Prize to hire an assistant. Uh, one year later, uh, they've got their second daughter, Eve, and uh, she will hire a Polish governess 
to teach your daughters a native language. So I would say at that time, everything is fine. There are, uh, I would say, at, at the top of the situation in terms of personal, professional, and family moments. But uh, there's a tragedy because in uh, 1906, Pierre Curie is killed in a road accident. He's walking across the Rue Dauphine in heavy rain. He's struck by a vehicle with horses. He fell under its wheels and uh, his skulls is totally fractured. So Mary is of course devastated by her, her husband's death. And a few days after Pierre's death, Mary begins to diary that she kept for almost uh, a year. And um, it's interesting because uh, less than a month after Pierre's death, the University of Paris proposed a national pension. Mary refused it. And uh, they suggest that uh, she could assume Pierre's duty at the Sorbonne. And in her diary, Curry is writing, they have uh, offered that I should take your place, my Pierre. I accepted. I don't know if it is good or bad. You have said to me that you would have liked for me to teach a course at the Sorbonne. Here, here, here it is the, the possibility for me. It will take two more years for the Sorbonne to officially recognize her position. And uh, of course, she is the first woman to obtain this position in the history of the, of the Sorbonne. This is uh, uh, indeed amazing, uh, this day for her. And, and what's happened after, after her, her husband has died. But how was her first day as a teacher? It's interesting because a short story, by 10 a.m., there's hundreds of people are lining up in the front of the doors of the Sorbonne Physics Lecturer. The Mary students from SEV are presented as were many scientists. Uh, there's um, the grandfather of Irene who is here. And when they opened the door at 1.50 p.m., several hundred people rush into the room, whereas the capacity of the amphitheater on the, on the theater is only 120. So there's journalists, photographers, ladies and gentlemen, it seems all Paris is here. Uh, another thing uh, I will speed up, but uh, of course she, she succeeded in isolating radium and she put an international standard for radioactive emission, the curry. And uh, another thing is that in 1911, uh, she had to deal with uh, an affair, I would say, because the, it is revealed with stolen letters that Mary is involved with a young law affair with a physicist called Paul Langevin. Uh, it's, he's a former student of Pierre Curie, and the, the problem, I would say, for the opinion is he's a married man, he's, even he's a tall man and so on, he can be, uh, he, he's five years younger than Mary, uh, he's uh, famous because he reached to the same conclusion that Albert Einstein of uh, E equals MC2, but uh, he did after, uh, after Einstein. Um, he's a friend, his soulmate, he's a potential partner in science who might replace Pierre. And in the opinion, there's a really, um, yeah, uh, some defiance uh, regarding uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, situation. This so is a, this, a, this is a, a, a very, with, I, I didn't know that, that she had this affair. It's, it's really uh, something that we discovered and, uh, and how is, 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 did affect this, this story affected her life, her professional life? Exactly, because- It was uh, a scandal, huh? Yes, it was a scandal. It's a press scandal and it's exploited by her academic opponents because in parallel of this affair, she's owner a second time with a Nobel Prize, but in chemistry. And she will be the first person to win or share two Nobel Prizes but uh, Mary doesn't stand the scandal and uh, she's fragile and she's first saying that uh, she's not going to, uh, to, to, to take, um, to take uh, the prize. Even there's a member of the Nobel committee wrote uh, 
on behalf of the committee, asking her not coming to Sweden to accept her prize. He sits, yes, uh, the love letters of uh, Mr. Langevin, and he says if the academy had believed the letter might be authentic, it wouldn't. In all probability, we would have given you the prize. So it's really, really difficult. And yeah, this is, is it, it, it will, would not ever happen here now, huh? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and is, and yeah. a month after accepting the Nobel Prize, she's hospitalized with depression. And uh, she decided at that time to avoid all public life and to spend time in England and to have break for 14 months and uh, and to yeah to 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 push through all, all this work with uh, with uh, schools of radioactivity and so on uh, but uh, definitely it was a tough period but if you if you follow oh, so she story. was always uh, she was also uh, involved in the during the second world war yeah, and, exactly. uh, and saved a lot of lives and and we have to speed up because it's yeah. it's, 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 yeah. it's so you, you, there is a connection between her and uh, uh, the previous lady Edith Cavell so she saved a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, men yeah. as well just as, yeah, as yeah, because she procures all X-ray equipment, vehicles, generators, developed mobile radiography units, and what we call little curries. And it is estimated that all the equipment designed by Curie had certainly saved the lives of million soldiers. Uh, the French government will uh, uh, try to give her the Legion of Honor. She will wish it. But yes, she had really uh, an important engagement during the First World War. And... Um, Yes, to speed up, of course, there's yeah. an international legacy uh, because she will visit the United States in uh, 1921. Um, uh, we, uh, she will travel to other countries in Belgium, in Brazil, in Spain, Czechoslovakia. Uh, they will, uh, she, will, uh, she will help her daughter to, uh, to, um, to, to uh, how would I say, um, to uh, design the, the new uh, Joliot Curie uh, Institute. So uh, one, it's important because she has a, a lot of uh, legacy with, uh, with, her with her daughter. She involves in, um, in the worldwide scientific cooperation. Here you can see a picture, an interesting picture. She's the only woman between all these scientists and men. Um, and she will die in 1934 in France and uh, in Passy. And uh, there was a debate because uh, did she die from uh, radioactivity? It's not definitely uh, certain uh, because uh, some said uh, that she, she has been more uh, exposed to X-ray during the First World War than uh, radioactivity. But you had to know that Pierre and Marie Curie now are in Panthéon since 1995, and uh, their, their um, how can we say, the, all the, um, oh, sorry, the remains, sealed, <laughs> the remains are sealed in a light leaning because of the radioactivity. All the books and so on are sealed because of radioactivity. So uh, yes, that's what you get in mind. She, she was known for her honesty and moderated lifestyle. And you had to know that uh, also your brand commission set up a Mar Maris Klodowska uh, fellowship program for all the European Union for young scientists. So the main key messages, and I will speed up, is relationship and collaboration. They succeed to work together to be a couple and raised family. They take care, uh, they forgot to take care uh, of themselves, I would say, because they were so devoted that they forgot their, uh, their own well being. It was really surprising when I performed some research on it. Uh, during First World War, Marie procures assistance to soldiers and gives meaning to her work. So she acts usefully during crisis. And she think about legacy and transmission. She succeeded to transmit her passion in sciences with. Uh, our daughter, Irene Giulio Curie. Now let's see the last, uh, the last character uh, for the last 10 minutes, sorry, about this uh, webinar. 
about Melina Mercouris. She is Greek, she is an actress, but also you will see she is a really uh, famous in politics. She has a lot of skills, as you can see, uh, and kind of same characteristic with the two other women. She is involved, she's fragile, she's obstinate. And her main achievements, I would say, is that she used to be an influent ambassador of Greek and European culture. So let's see about uh, Melina Mercury. She is born in 1920 at Athens in a famous Greek family at that time. And uh, you have to know that uh, her um, grandfather is mayor of Athens. He will remain for uh, mayor of Athens for 30 years. And she had a really uh, intense, um, I would say, relationship with, uh, with him. And it's a model uh, for, uh, for Melina, uh, especially as he's a mayor of Athens, but he's a sweet uh, grandfather. So uh, Melina, uh, definitely, she, 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 he, for her, she, um, she faces other difficulties than uh, Edith and, uh, and Mary. Uh, there's a lot of uh, changes in Greece because Greece become a republic. Uh, she's only four, uh, and uh, her grandfather will be uh, the destitute as mayor of uh, Athens. But uh, her goal in her life is to become an artist. And it's interesting because she, uh, she definitely has some artistic talents. At 10 years old, she, Melina, she, she's, uh, she's in the island of Spades. Uh, in the in the house of the family, she walks into a cafe, and and uh, she decides to perform a dance. And uh, the consumer are really happy of that. In a few minutes, her mother is won by a mysterious phone call. Melina receives a masterful slap in her face, and but for her it doesn't matter because the only thing that matters is that people applauded people applauded Melina talents. So at that time, uh, she decided she wants to be uh, an artist. But her parents and grandfather are well returned to artistic career. She will face really difficulty for that. She will, uh, of course, she knows she's beautiful. She, uh, she, uh, she kind of provocatrice and so, so uh, all the boys in college are in love with her. And she becomes the mascot of the Athens Cadet School. But uh, I would say uh, the, she didn't get the support of her parents about uh, the aesthetic career. And um, when her mother and stepfather went on vacation to Mytilene in the fall of 1938, she participates in audition for the entrance of the School of Dramatic Art of the National Theatre. So she, she did all this action of artists secretly. She secretly goes to theater classes. At 18, she's getting married with Panos, a rich Greek man, but in fact, he, he was more in love uh, for, uh, uh, I would say, uh, for, uh, for, for his beauty, but there's no real uh, hard feelings between, between them. And uh, another thing that's important, it's the Second World War because the German is invading Athens in April 1941. Her father, her brother, they are resistance, but for her, uh, Melina did quite nothing, I would say, to resist to, uh, during, the, during the war. She, uh, she, she, want to, she doesn't want to be a knowing during this period. You will see that it will be different at another moment of the Greek history. So she, uh, she's, she, she has several uh, achievements because uh, she, uh, she succeeded in uh, playing uh, in theater and with the streetcar named Desire. She performed a Paris trip when she will meet uh, a lot of celebrity. Uh, she will discover Marcel Pagnol, Jean Cocteau, Sacha Guitry, Colette, François Sagan. And um, she returned in Greece in 1953, and she will perform well uh, in theater, but also in movies. And the movie Stella is the real start of the career in Greece. Stella is, um, is, a, is a Greek movie from Mikhail Kakayounis. He, 
Kakoyonis, and this uh, director will be the director of Zorba the Greek. And um, what is important, it's 1955, because the film Stella is selected in Cannes, and during uh, the Cannes Festival, she's meeting Jules Dassin. Jules Dassin, uh, in fact, she lost the interpretation prize of actress, and Jules Dassin will console, uh, I would say, her by saying, you're worth more than a prize. And Melina uh, will definitely uh, fall in love with uh, Jules Dassin. They've got the number 18 in common because uh, she, they are born all together in October 18. Their respective grandfathers were born in December 18. They were getting married in, in, the, in, in May 18 in 1966. So uh, definitely she, she found her Pygmalion. And Never on Sunday, it's a movie that changed everything. It's a movie about a Greek um, a woman and an American. And of course, it's quite a, their story. And it's a huge, huge success in Greece and everywhere in the, in the world. And she starts to sing also a famous song, The Children of Pyrrhus. And uh, this is a, such an important movie that uh, it helped about uh, Greece promotion. So she will earn uh, several prizes, Best Actress Award in Cannes Festival, uh, BAFTA, and so on. And this is the start of the international recognition, even in the US, because she will have the Broadway opportunity to transpose Never on Sunday into a musical in 1967. But at the time, 1967, it's an important, uh, an important date for uh, Greek history because there's a military putsch in Athens. And uh, the putsch is going to put Melina out of the cinema, out of stage, and will transform the, her life, I would say, for, forever. She, will, she, she definitely will lead the resistance from the US side to protest against the dictatorship of the Greek colonels. So uh, she tried to, uh, to, um, to, um, yeah, to, uh, to denounce uh, all, the, all the dictators. So definitely the US decided to place Melina Mercury under the protection of the FBI. And uh, for example, she's the target of an attack. She, uh, she, uh, she, um, she succeeded to, uh, to avoid of an attempt of, uh, of a bomb of uh, three uh, kilo, kilogram. So, uh, so yeah, she definitely uh, put her life in the middle of this, uh, of this, um, of this uh, I would say, combat. Uh, and in November 1973, student riots left 400 dead in Athens. And seven months later, the, dictator, the dictatorship falls. And uh, so it's the success of uh, Greek, uh, Greek democracy, but because Greece becomes free again, but it's the start of a political career because Definitely a lot of many Greeks anticipate that Melina will stand for election. And they are right because uh, Melita, Melina uh, will uh, decide to, uh, to go into politics. And uh, she first, she, uh, she, um, she failed to be, uh, to, to be a deputy. Uh, and she will be beaten on her first attempt. But in 1977, she's the first woman deputy of the region of the Pire, uh, and um, in 1981, uh, she's promoted because she becomes Minister of Culture. And uh, she has a different relationship, different uh, uh, conviction with other Ministry of Culture, like Jack Lang, like other people. She will also be ministry, uh, Minister of Culture in 1994 for a shorter period. But what is important is during this, uh, uh, this period, she will introduce free access to museum and archaeological sites for Greek citizens. She organized uh, a series of exhibition of Greek cultural heritage. Uh, she performed a lot of cultural action, and she will uh, perform a battle. Is the coming back of the, the return of the marble of 
Parthenon, because they are, uh, the marble of Parthenon are located in, uh, in the British Museum. And she will have a crusade, uh, I would say, to, uh, to, 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 to ask for the return of the marbles. And, and uh, that would be uh, really uh, important uh, in, for, for in terms of conviction. And in terms of European legacy, you may know that uh, it's owing Melina Mercury that we've got the European capital of cultures. Uh, yes, of course, Athens will be the first one uh, to be European of cultures. And uh, since 1984, now you've got different uh, European uh, capital of cultures. So uh, the key message for Melina Mercury, it's be aware of your strengths. She was aware of her beauty, her passion for entertainment and how to be persuasive. Uh, you have more than one career because she succeeded to have a political career despite critics and no experience. And uh, don't hesitate to dare if you think you're right about the marble, part, the marble of Parthenon. She dares once again because she had strong conviction and UNESCO supported her action. To go further, uh, if you're really interested of Edith Cavell, of Maria Curie, and of course, Melina Mercury, uh, definitely uh, you can uh, go deeper with this biography, with a uh, movie, for example, Radioactive also, that has been released last year. And uh, yes, this three biography helped me to to, uh, to build all this, uh, all this information together and all this story of these three uh, women, uh, exceptional women. If you're interested, uh, I've got a uh, podcast of different uh, portrait, uh, business and management. So uh, I take an example of, uh, of uh, events, of, uh, of um, scientists and so on, not, not only women, but uh, there are a lot of men, there are a lot of men as well. I exactly. heard this morning, it's, it's very interesting, but it's in French, and you, you connected the, all the slides to, 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 um, to this uh, today. Take the lessons from their lives, exactly. and there is a lot of connection between their lives and our lives.